Letter 13 The Dearer, June 2nd, 1933 Dear fellow students, One year ago today, this disciple first met the Master in the physical body. For one holy year, we have lived in close association with the greatest of modern Mahatmas. Today there is so much that we would like to say to our American confrere, and the words forsake us. The heart is full, but the art of expression seems to be lost. I wonder if I can write this letter at all. When the master becomes such a large part of one's life, one realises more and more how impossible it is to tell one's friends the story. He really longs to just take them by the hand and say, Come, see him for yourself. Longing to be with the Master Today I am reminded how for years and years I wished I might have been with Jesus when he was on earth, to have been his disciple, following him over those Judean hills and down to Galilee and Jerusalem, watching his gracious ministry and, if possible, giving some loving service. Often, in years long past, the thought haunted me day and night. But never did I imagine it would be my good fortune to have that wish gratified in substance. But now I have only to transfer the scene from Palestine to India and change the date. And in this good year of 1933, I am walking daily by the side and sitting at the holy feet of the great living master. My impulse is to grasp his sacred feet and thank him that he has permitted me to see this fortunate day. Out of all the hundred and twenty millions of my fellow countrymen, I consider that I am the most fortunate. Today I feel a sense of pity for the masses who do not appear to realise what a priceless privilege might be theirs. They are letting the golden opportunity slip by them. They do not seem to understand, now any better than they did in the days of Jesus, that a great master is among them. They are so blinded by the God or gods of this world that the great light, which now shines among them, is quite invisible to them. Truly, the light is shining into the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. Perhaps, two thousand years from now, many who read the history of our Master may look back with longing and wish they had lived in his day, so that they might have seen him and might have become his disciples. Theological Misconceptions But some of my American friends will say, Yes, but your master in India is not Jesus. He is only a mere man, while Jesus was the Son of God. Both of these assertions are due to theological misconceptions. Jesus himself never thought that he was anything above and beyond the possibilities of other men. In fact, he taught the exact contrary. Get the New Testament and read his own words, not the words of Paul the theologian. There is not a word in the New Testament, except perhaps one or two interpolations, in which Jesus makes any claim to an exclusive divine sonship. Such a thing was never thought of until long after his death. But let us say he was a son of God in a special sense. Divine sonship is the goal of all spiritual aspirations. It is the very sum and substance of all yoga, which means union with God. If Jesus became a divine son, other men can become divine sons. Why any set of theological speculators should ever limit that sonship to only one man in all human history still remains one of the mysteries. 
This divine sonship is exactly what makes a man a true master. All masters are sons of God in a special sense. They have risen to heights of spiritual unfoldment and have united their human attributes with those of the Supreme One. And thus they have attained divine sonship. They are then no longer sons simply in the sense of having been created by God, but they are sons by virtue of having united their spiritual essence with that of the Supreme Father. Aye, they are even more than that. They are practically identical with the Father because of this oneness. There is no difference between them except that the Master still resides here in the human form. This is the ultimate goal of Mastership, but it is a goal toward which all men may look if they make themselves Masters after the example and pattern of their own Master. It must ever be borne in mind that Mastership and Divine Sonship are not limited to one individual on this planet, but it is an achievement within the reach of an unlimited number running through all the ages of human history. A Serious Theological Blunder It must now be apparent to the student that it is a fatal error to assume that there is and can be only one Christ or Divine Son. By such an assumption, a man shuts the door of opportunity in his own face. He dooms himself to continue wandering in the wilderness when he might sit down at the banquet table in the palace of his father. Besides, for such an assumption, there is no rational need. It is utterly without reason or fact to support it. It accomplishes no good purpose while doing vast harm. And it is a poor and limited view of the Supreme Father. Indeed, poor in resources would he be if he were so limited that he could send into this world only one great teacher during all the millions of years of its history, and then under such circumstances that comparatively few of Earth's inhabitants would ever know anything about him. The most ardent claimant of this doctrine is forced to admit that even if this doctrine were true, the entire scheme has been a dismal failure. In the final wind-up, a mere insignificant fraction of the human race will ever be saved by and through this system or scheme of salvation. Let us therefore discard such notions and come and worship today at the holy feet of a living Christ. Our Father is abundant in mercy and his gracious manifestations are not limited to any one country, race or age. Let us come and follow the Master now to divine sonship and mastership ourselves. Only in this way can we honour him and the Supreme Father and share in his infinite love to the full measure. All Master's Teachings the Same The teachings of all Masters are essentially the same, though their methods may differ due to individual inclinations and also to the country and people among whom they manifest. Jesus worked many miracles, especially healing the sick, our Master here does comparatively few miracles. This is not because he has less power to do them. It is because he does not consider that the best method of carrying out his mission. Faith founded on miracles is not enduring. Besides, such a method draws about the Master great crowds of curiosity seekers. It fixes attention upon material benefits, while the work of the Master is to emphasise the supreme importance of the spiritual. It aims at spiritual benefits only. It seeks to break the bonds of this world which have held the souls of men in thrall so long 
and it aims to lift them up to spiritual freedom. The Masters have found by ages of experience that the best way to accomplish these ends is to convert people by righteous living, by gentle persuasion, by holy precept and example, by convincing the reason, by appealing to intelligence, by wisely pointing out the holy path. When men are converted in this way, they are ready to devote their lives to the Master's path and to go with him all the way. Things insisted upon by Masters In all the ages, the Masters have insisted upon three things as fundamental. First, a clean and holy life, free from all self-indulgence in the pleasures of sense, and given over to good deeds. Second, the absolute necessity of a living master to guide and to help the disciple over the rough ways and to lead him inward and upward to higher regions. Third, the inner spirit, the creative energy by whose operation and power the individual transformation takes place. This inner power is called by Jesus and his followers, the Logos or Word. In some places in the New Testament, it is called the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. Some saints have called it Galma, others Nad, and yet others, including our Master, call it Shabbat or the Sound Current. By whatever name, it is the same creative force, for by it all things have been created, and by it they are sustained. It is the Infinite Father reaching down to the individual man to give illumination and power, and finally to lead him to his eternal home, after it has purified and fitted him for that abode. Only a slight difference in terminology but the cardinal facts remain the same. There can be only one holy way to the highest spiritual achievements, to the ultimate reality. The Master on Tour Again Early in the month of April, the Master left the Deera on another extended tour to various cities and towns and country villages. As usual, Everywhere he went, great crowds gathered about him, worshipping him and seeking deeper knowledge of the holy path. Everywhere the interest appears to be growing and the numbers are increasing who seek initiation. This disciple remained in the Dera for the greater part of the month, but finally joined the Master on the 27th at a little village in the mountains by the name of Chalet. It lies up in the foothills of the great Himalayas. There is really no town there, but a cluster of houses here and there scattered over a group of hills, all inhabited by the descendants of mountain tribes who have, for many years, been connected with the military establishment. They are a people with deep feelings and strong attachments, sturdy and loyal, kind and generous. They gave this disciple, as well as the master, a most cordial welcome to their homes. Among them, the master has a large following. This disciple, accustomed to unusual manifestations toward the master, was quite amazed at the demonstrations witnessed in that mountain region. We left the motor bus in a deep canyon and climbed a steep hill, perhaps six or eight hundred feet, to a small area where satsang was to be held. Streamers and decorations of all sorts had been lavishly set up to welcome the master. The master had not yet arrived in this section when we arrived. He came at seven the next morning. The good people, all devoted disciples of the master, made us welcome with the most unstinted generosity and kindness. It happened to be the original home of Burrasram, personal servant to this disciple. He comes of a good family, and all of his people joined to make the American particularly welcome, 
some of them even offering presents. They said it was the first visit ever made to their homes by any European or American. Booming of guns welcomes the master. In the morning, just as the master's car appeared half a mile away in the canyon, a shot was fired from the lookout station on the hill. As he came closer, another shot was fired. These shots were to announce to all that the master was approaching and to sound their first note of welcome. The people rushed to the tops of the hills overlooking the canyon, all eager to see the master. Many descended the hill to the place where his car was to stop. The people came in hundreds and thousands. The hillsides were lined with them. Old men came, slowly hobbling over their canes. They must be there for the darshan of their beloved Maharajji. It was a rare treat that they were to enjoy, a treat which some of them would perhaps never have again in this life. A considerable number of us went down into the canyon to meet the master as he got out of his car. There he gave his loving Radha Swami to us. We then followed him up the steep hill, which he climbed like a boy of eighteen, to a cluster of houses where quarters had been arranged for us all. It was an inspiring sight to witness the devotion here shown by the people to their adored master. It was no ordinary friendship or esteem, neither was it anything like the ovations given to political leaders or national heroes. It was worship actuated by the deepest affection. They all wanted him to set his holy feet inside of their houses, and he tried to accommodate them all as nearly as possible. Many of them had spent days, even weeks, in preparing special decorations inside of their houses, in anticipation of this notable event. If they had been permitted, they would have showered him with all sorts of presents, but that he will never permit. He accepts no presents of any kind, but he is pleased when they show real love. He does not like them to bow at his feet and worship the outer human form, but this cannot always be prevented. He accepts their love with evident pleasure and in all humility. One woman here, the wife of a military officer, could not control her impulse to worship him, and so threw her arms about his legs and bowed down to the ground, holding his feet. He gently removed her and told her that it was not the right way to worship the master. She should go inside and up into the higher regions and there meet and worship the master in his radiant form. The human form should not be worshipped, he said, but the people will worship the human form also, for great is their love. How anyone in the human form even the divinest of men, can inspire such love and devotion as this master does, as being one of the deep mysteries which this disciple has been trying to fathom ever since he arrived in India. But it still eludes his grasp. It is one of the great miracles daily performed by this master. We feel that it constitutes one of the visible evidences of his mastership. Great Satsang in the Mountains The crowds continued to gather all day long and to spread over the hills until two o'clock when the master held satsang. More than 8,000 people were seated before him. In such a mountain region, necessarily thinly populated, such a crowd is nothing short of marvellous. Where they all came from, one could only wonder. From all the mountains and valleys, round about they continued to pour in. Many delegations of prominent men, officers from the military stations, headmen of villages, some of patriarchal appearance, and also smartly dressed young officers, 
all came to pay their respects to the Holy Father and to listen to his gracious words. For four days the Master held satsang for these people. The crowds diminished not at all, but rather increased. Finally, the last meeting was held under a big banyan tree down in the canyon. This disciple sat near the master's side, and as the master spoke, he watched the faces of the crowd. They fairly hung upon the master's words. Deep interest was apparent everywhere. Here and there, a tear could be seen dropping from someone's face, and then smiles and laughter would burst forth, as the master related some amusing story to illustrate his point. The master is an adept at pointed stories, quotations and illustrations to drive home his message. He is highly eloquent in the true sense of that term. It must not be assumed that this mountain audience was a lot of illiterate people. Far from it. Among them were numerous college graduates, hundreds of keen brains and critical minds. Many of them were learned in the literatures and sciences of this world. As this writer watched and studied the faces of the people, he could at the same time glance up to the snow-covered Himalayas towering just above us. The sight was thrilling. For ages this has been the region of the Mahathmas, the forest temples of those great men who have become more than men, and yet linger here that they may continue to teach all who seek the light. These mountain retreats and deep valleys for untold generations have witnessed master and disciple walking their trails or sitting upon some mountain crag looking up at those same snow-covered summits. But probably never before since the dawn of creation, never since the first master ascended those heights have such crowds waited there upon the words of a Mahatma. Never before in the history of mankind have such large numbers flocked to the holy feet of a living Sadhguru, as this American was privileged to witness today. If only its significance might be duly appreciated, it marked a distinct epoch in the higher development of mankind. Usually, all through the ages, it has been only the few brave and daring souls who sought the higher path. According to the old systems of yoga, the path was extremely difficult and even hazardous. But now, thanks to the most merciful one, the path has been made easier and all may follow it who will. Infinite love has opened wider the gates. And now many more are listening to the call and entering the golden gate of opportunity. One could almost fancy that these deep mountain retreats themselves were filled with gladness at hearing the divine voice of a living Mahatma addressing the people by the thousand. Eight hundred are initiated. Finally, the candidates for initiation were assembled after the last public meeting had been held. After many had been rejected, the master initiated 800. He personally inspects each and every one. Many are deferred. No one but the master knows who is to be initiated and who deferred. He only glances at each one as they stand in line. It is a deep mystery to everyone else why this one or that one is deferred. Sometimes there is sad disappointment both to the applicant and to his people, but the deferred ones are told very kindly to come back some other time and in the meantime to give further study to the teachings and the duties and responsibilities of discipleship. Perhaps some of those deferred will be ready the next time or some years later. But the master knows instantly who is ready now. Only those who bear the mark are accepted. Only the master knows what that mark is and he can see it at a glance. 
everyone designated by the Supreme Lord for the initiation, is stamped by some unmistakable sign which the Master can recognise instantly. Only they get the initiation. The Master returns to the Dera. The finishing of the initiations in this village, together with a short satsang held the next morning in a village on the way down out of the mountains, completed the Master's work of this tour. He was ready to return to the Dera the next day, to which a few of us preceded him while he stopped overnight with attorney Bhagat Singh in Jalanda city. We reached the Dera on May 2nd. This tour of the Master has marked an epoch in the history of the Master's work. In fact, an epoch in the history of Santamat in India. In my last letter, I mentioned the fact that the Master had initiated about 2,500 during the month of March. We thought that a large number, and indeed it was, but that number was greatly exceeded in April. Thousands initiated during April. During this April tour, many villages and towns were visited by the Master. He was greeted everywhere by crowds running into the thousands. This has been the banner month in Punjab, and, so far as we know, in all India and for all time among the services of the saints. During the month of April alone, the Master initiated 4,900. It constitutes about 10% of the total number initiated by our Master since he began his work here about 30 years ago. So the devotion and the enthusiasm continue to increase. Such large numbers applying for initiation would have been utterly impossible in the earlier ages and was not thought of even a hundred years ago. But the spiritual atmosphere of the whole world is rapidly changing and the effect is being felt by large numbers who are turning their attention to spiritual things. This is why, among all nations, the feeling is becoming more and more pronounced that an era of spiritual awakening is now dawning. And so it is. Old, obsolete forms are passing and people are beginning to seek the truth. And everywhere the souls of men are catching the first gleams of the happy dawn. What the future will bring forth, only the master knows but the outlook is exceedingly bright. The master is much overworked. The hot weather is now upon us, and we shall soon be leaving for the hill stations to escape the excessive heat of this section. The dear master shows the effect of the prolonged strain, continuous hard work with almost no time for rest, day or night and now the heat is making it harder for him, although he stands it all much better than anyone else. We are begging him to drop the work and go at once to cooler regions. Just this morning he said so much work was pressing for attention. How could he leave it? They are coming to him from all over the country in ever larger numbers, we begged him to consider his health and leave the pressing work and the heat. He smiled and made only a partial promise. When we told him that there would be plenty of work to be done here a thousand years from now, he laughed and said, yes, no doubt. The May satsang was attended by something like 12,000 people in spite of the busy season among the farmers. About 350 souls were initiated at the end of this meeting. I am glad to announce that the English translation of the Sarbajan is now on the way to the press, and we hope it will be ready for distribution before so very long. It will be a valuable addition to our literature. Also, the Master has given his approval for the publication of this series of letters in book form. 
It will contain a number of interesting pictures besides that of our master and will include a brief summary of the teachings of Santa Mat. We expect to send it wherever the English language is spoken as a testimonial to the master. It will be the first effort of this sort in history to let the world know that there is a real master on earth. It will be translated into many other languages, we hope. Letter from Baba Jemal Singh We will now close this letter with a gem taken from a private letter written by the saint Jemal Singh to our master during the early days of his discipleship. He was guru to our master and is still much loved and venerated by him. In value, this letter is just the same as words from our own master. It has, in fact, a very special value to us, since its instructions were intended for our dear master during his early struggles as a student. It may be accepted with the utmost reliance upon every word. Radha Swami Radha Swamiji is the comforter. Radha Swami greetings from Jemal Singh to my obedient son, Babu Sawan Singh. The compassionate Anami Hazul Radha Swami is a wondrous Lord. Fathomless, nameless and formless is he. The stream of divine knowledge is flowing. So the current of mercy is about to come and is already coming. But a single veil still remains. Surrender yourself, my son. All that exists, the inner faculties of Surat and Nirith, the gross mind, the higher mind, the vital energy, the physical body, the three bodies, gross, astral, causal, etc. That is to say, the states that manifest themselves in the cycle of 24 hours, the attributes of the three bodies, the worldly possessions of the physical body, do not let your mind desire any of these, nor should you concern yourself with what will happen next or how you will do it. Put aside all such anxieties. All your possessions were given to you in the beginning by the Satguru, so they should have been held in trust. They were never to be regarded as your own. Now the Satguru's will has to be engraved in your mind. Understand that I am nothing. All is the Satguru's. I do not exist. Everything that exists, the soul, intellect, mind and all the means for performing worldly activities, none of these belongs to you. They all belong to the Satguru. They should be completely removed from your mind. The reality of life is the soul, my son. The mind and soul received every provision from Sajkhand to go about their duty in the land of Gaal after receiving the Shabbat from the Satguru. They were to merge into the current of the Shabbat to enable the soul to return to Sajkhand. The soul and mind, however, have completely forgotten this command and by intermingling with Maya have fallen under its control and now consider everything to be their own. The soul and mind have both been imprisoned by Maya and Gaal has pressed them down with the weight of karmas. So long as a disciple does not take out the self, by surrendering his all to the Satguru and removing himself from everything, he will not be liberated. So surrender yourself and step aside, my son. Consider that each and everything in the world, body, mind and wealth, belongs to the Satguru, that you are nothing. Do all your work knowing it to be thus, and stay within the Satguru's instructions. He will then take you with him when he considers you fit. Engrave within your mind a deep love and devotion for his lotus feet and keep lying in their refuge. 
The Shabad Dun is a blessing from the Satguru, my son. It is a gift that will never disappear. One day the Dun will take you to Sachkhand. Love the Shabad Dun with devotion every day and keep alive the inner longing for it. For the rest, we are to remain happy in the will of the compassionate Hazur. All of them are urged to do their bhajan and simran every day. So, you have received less work this year. Stay pleased with that, my son, and do your bhajan. The only thing that is ours is Nam, the Shabad Dun. With love and devotion, keep the inner faculties of the soul, Surat and Nirat, fixed in that alone. With your hands and feet, and the help of the mind, attend to your worldly work and keep the love and faith of the higher mind at the Sadhguru's holy feet. Radha Swami from Bibi and all the people at the Dera to all of you. May grace and mercy be upon everyone. For the rest, my son, I welcome whatever is the will of Hazur Swamiji. And so, this disciple sends his Radha Swami to you all. Do not forget the injunction of this letter to fix your steadfast attention and love upon Shabbat Dun and the holy benediction of the Master will rest upon you. Affectionately, your fellow student, Julian P. Johnson.